of that the church would be comfortable with um, because we are not in the realm strictly of science. We're in the realm of science and faith. So I think that it's safe to say that they found a site that 150 years or 100 years after Peter's death, people thought was the grave of Peter. However, we're talking about a century, century and a half after Peter's death um, in a situation where his body was almost certainly not recovered. So the actual grave is it's a bit of a stretch. So a, a, a site that may have been venerated, mm -hmm. no concrete proof, mm -hmm. but definitely no bones. Definitely no bones that could be associated with Peter or with that particular monument. They were found in a box years later um, in a completely different um, area, in a work, uh, a storage room, um, maybe 20 meters away from the actual site, with a little faded uh, paper ticket explaining where they had come from. Whose bones were they? What, what, what did they actually find then? What did they attribute to these bones to? Uh -huh. Well, uh, remember, we're digging, they were digging in a, in a graveyard, um, so there would have been plenty of people to choose from. In this box were also the bones of several farmyard animals, um, sheep and um, oxen, and even the entire skeleton of a mouse. So it was a bit of a mishmash. Is this really what it means to be a disciple? A symbol of power based on a church tradition that some scholars now say has little basis in historical fact. That prompted a new pope, desperate to make his mark by finding Peter's grave, to begin digging in total secrecy. And a Vatican-led investigation that found an ancient monument that the pope declared is the tomb of Peter and then a later pope who claimed to have miraculously discovered the actual bones of Peter. I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility that at certain points in this long drawn out affair, a word was whispered to someone inside the dig, a suggestion was made. Certainly there is a conspiracy of the faith and an overwhelming gravity of belief that would have drawn people who see the real presence of Peter in the site, to conclude that the results supported that, the pious conclusion rather than the scientific one. Since the excavations and the Pope's announcement of the discovery of Peter's remains, the Vatican has allowed the public into the tomb. But when we requested permission to film there, we were refused. So if Peter isn't here, where could he be? Is there an alternative explanation? If you look in the Bible, in the Acts of the Apostles, Peter's story is given in some detail. The story in Acts tells us where Peter was in the first century. Peter was in uh, the area around Palestine and Syria. So some people now think that Peter died in the mid first century, around the time when he disappears from the story in Acts, and he died in the area of Palestine or Syria, maybe. But certainly around the area of Palestine is the best guess, I think, for where Peter died. At almost the same time that the Pope announced to the world that he had found the tomb of St. Peter in Rome, 1,500 miles away, there was another discovery of an ancient grave on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. In 1953, two Franciscan monks were digging in a cave when they discovered hundreds of first century ossuaries, coffins, from the time of Jesus and the 12 disciples. As it happens with so many important discoveries, this happened uh, by chance. They were building a wall from one property to another property, and they started to discover um, ancient tombs with um, bones, uh, with ossuaries, and the most important thing, inscriptions. These Catholic archaeologists believed they had found the earliest physical evidence of a Christian community in Jerusalem, including some very familiar biblical names. 
We encounter the name of Jesus, of Joseph, of uh, Simon, uh, of Lazarus, of Zacharias, uh, of Martha, of Maria. <laughs> Very common name in the time of, um, of Jesus. But one of them was a potentially explosive find. It read, Shimon bar Jonah, Simon son of Jonah, the original biblical name of the disciple Peter. Jesus called him Simon bar Jonas. So it was very interesting to, far, to find uh, not one uh, name only, but the two names, the name of the person and the name of uh, his uh, father. This time, there was no papal fanfare, no global announcement, absolutely no publicity. The official line was that this couldn't be the grave of Peter. He was buried in Rome. Surely they must have been intrigued because it's so clear, isn't it? Simon bar Jonah, Ju yes. Jesus uses that yes. name. Surely they must have thought that there was some connection there between this ossuary and Peter, the disciple. Yes, sometimes you find the name together, but uh, you don't have to jump to the conclusions and uh, to say uh, it is uh, these uh, known people and it is uh, another known people because uh, it can be also some unknown people with the same name. What would that mean for the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church if that archaeological evidence that they suggest was correct and he was buried here? Exactly, it's impossible because uh, the history and archaeology are together in, uh, in saying that Peter is in Rome. But if these ossuaries are dated, as you've said, in the first century, and then the traditions of Peter being in Rome are later, the second century, surely the archaeology and the history lies here with the ossuaries. The archaeology here is in regard only to a name written on, the, on, on a box. There is no other proof than the, what is inside the box are the bones of Peter. Uh, instead, in, in Rome, the archaeology which is there is uh, related to a tradition. The original bone box with the Shimon bar Jonah inscription is now stored in a small Franciscan museum in Jerusalem. We wanted to see it, but when we asked, once again, our request to film was refused. If in fact Peter did die and is buried in Jerusalem, it would be earth-shattering for the Catholic Church. It would overturn a 1900-year tradition that has at its root papal power and authority over one billion Catholics. It would mean that Jerusalem, and not Rome, is the Church's headquarters. In the next part, we look at how Europeans have deployed the power of the Twelve Disciples to maintain their dominance of Christianity, and why the story of another disciple who left Palestine after Jesus' death to set up a church in the East has been so ignored by the West. Could the church in India be older than the one in Rome? In one of the most important passages in the New Testament, Jesus tells his followers to go and make disciples of all nations, to travel to the ends of the earth and spread his message. One disciple took this command literally and traveled further than the rest, but whose story has always been dismissed by Western scholars as Christian fantasy. According to tradition, just 20 years after Jesus' death, the disciple Thomas boarded a boat in Palestine and ended up in India. Outside a small town on the west coast of India, every year there is a massive religious convention. More than 100,000 people come here from all over India to celebrate their Christian heritage. 
They claim to be one of the oldest Christian communities anywhere in the world, founded by one of Jesus' original disciples just 20 years after his death. If their story is true, the implications are huge. That Christianity reached India before large parts of Europe, including the British Isles. But until recently, most Western scholars claimed it was a physical impossibility that anyone could have crossed the Arabian Sea in the first century. And so it was ridiculous to suggest that Indian Christianity could have been founded by the disciple Thomas. This place is now called Kudungalur. Probably the first century port of Muziris was in this vicinity. I have come to meet one of India's leading experts on the story of Thomas and India. Using the monsoon winds, it was very easy for boats and ships to come from the east coast of Egypt to Muziris in Kerala. There is a second century Christian text, the Acts of Judas Thomas, that tells how the disciple Thomas traveled on a boat from Palestine via Egypt across the Arabian Sea to India, arriving in 52 AD at the court of King Gundafaras. Now, people said that he never came to Gundafaras, there was no such king. So the story of the acts of Judas Thomas, it's all a cock and bull story, it's only a legend. But then in the 19th century, the coins of Gundafaras were discovered in large quantities. And now it is proved beyond any doubt that there was a constant trade going on between Kerala and Rome and Greece. So it was easy for him to come. There is more evidence for the arrival of Thomas in India than for the arrival of Peter in Rome. But Peter's arrival is accepted universally, at least by the Western world. But when you speak about Thomas's arrival, people are skeptical. According to this theory, when Thomas first arrived in India, he found a community of people very familiar